so good to be together again this morning. Certainly enjoyed so very much the gospel meeting that we had uh, just not long ago. Just uh, so very much appreciated the lessons that Larry Ping brought to us. If uh, you weren't able to be here during those nights, certainly uh, go on the website and, and listen to those lessons. He brought excellent lessons uh, every night and was so thankful for the way that he challenged us to uh, think about the Lord's Word in our daily lives and to examine ourselves and so so thankful for how we did that and just a joy to be together throughout that week. And as uh, we had that opportunity to reach out into the community, to invite people to come and hear the gospel preach, which is what we made our, our, our aim for that week and for that effort, uh, began thinking about what it is that we want other people to know about Jesus. Well, what is it really right off the bat that would be great to, to impress upon any visitor, anyone who maybe as we continue to uh, maybe make contact with individuals who maybe showed a little bit of interest during the meeting or maybe others who maybe couldn't make it but maybe continue to, to express uh, the idea that they are, are, are interested in knowing what we're doing here in this congregation and who we are as Lord, the Lord's people. But I couldn't help but think about an accusation that was made about Jesus that was intended to be kind of a slander about Him that ironically really was very true. And it's in, in Matthew chapter 11. just want to read that where uh, Jesus is, is addressing the fact that no matter what, what God tried to do to reach the Jewish people, essentially, whether it was with the preaching of John the Baptist or with the the uh, the gentle, uh, loving, kind way that Jesus approached individuals, nothing was good enough. No matter what the attempt to do, they were intent that they were not going to listen to the message of the gospel, to the message of Jesus. And, and so he is relating to his audience some of the things that they said to kind of dismiss uh, the, the preaching of both John the Baptist and Jesus. And they said something specifically about Jesus that I, I want to just ha meditate on a little bit here together. But Matthew chapter 11, I want to start reading in verse 16, where it says, But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces who call out to the other children and say, We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. And one of the things that I want to point out that they, they said about Jesus, they said he's a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And, and I've always kind of scratched my head a little bit when you, when you think about uh, if someone's trying to, to dismiss uh, the intentions of the Son of God and, and was doing so by basically saying, He's so helpful. He, he, he's so kind. He, he wants to be around sinful people. I, I can't imagine why that would be a, a derogatory statement, but we realized what they were saying was, He is such a friend to these sinners and apparently He endorses their sins. That's really what was meant by this accusation. Was that that he was being helpful, but they were saying that he, because he has such close connection with these sinful people, that he must uh, somehow uh, encourage them in their sins, uh, must somehow be uh, laying his, his hand of approval on them, and is in no way uh, trying to... to Conform or reform them or, or help, help them change. He just endorses them and he, he just goes right along with their sinful activity. And what's interesting is sometimes if we aren't careful, because we know ultimately that's what we're trying to do. Ultimately what we're trying to do is to relay the true message of repentance for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The gospel message is one of repentance. It is one that sinners need to change. And we in no way are to be relaying a message that says that we endorse the sinful activities of individuals who we want to come to be part of the Lord's church. We, we want sinners to change. We want them to be mournful for the sins that they have committed. 
We want them to come in full repentance and to accept the gospel of Jesus Christ. But one thing is very notable is how Jesus went about initially making contact with those very sinners. And what's very ironical about the accusation is that it was very true. And Jesus himself addresses this by saying, you know, wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. In other words, we will later find out the truth and, and how all this turns out. And really what Jesus meant by that statement was when you see sinners, former adulterers, former swindlers, former liars, former drunkards, changing their ways, you'll find out that when Jesus actually befriended people like that, it was to bring about that actual change. It was in no way to endorse the sin. It was in no way uh, to coddle them. And this is, it's okay, everybody does it. Don't, don't you worry, just, God just loves you as you are, and it's okay, don't, don't worry about it. No, he says wisdom actually vindicates when we see people like that changing, repenting. When we see someone like Simon, uh, or excuse me, uh, 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 not, not, not Simon, uh, uh, the, uh, the wee little man, uh, uh, Zacchaeus, I'm sorry, the, I'm, I'm getting, I got hit on the head Sunday on my trunk, uh, <laughs> I came down here, actually I still have a little bit of headache, I, I promise Beth I'm going to go to the doctor and uh, see if maybe I don't have minor concussion or something, but, but, so that might explain why I'm getting some names mixed up, so I apologize for that, Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus is the wee little man, and, and remember, remember what Zacchaeus said? He said yes. He fully admitted that what he was doing as a tax collector was wrong. But remember, he said, but if I have defrauded anybody of anything, I'm going to pay them back. And we see how Jesus responds. said, today I must come at your house. I, 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 I must dine with you as friends do. Wisdom was later vindicated by... Jesus befriended people because He wanted them to change, but He realized that they will not change unless they realize how much Jesus cares. Unless they realize how much Jesus is interested. Unless they realize how much Jesus truly is interested in their life. It will help them. And so I truly believe that we should be, as the enemies address Jesus, we should be, as Jesus was, friends a friend of tax collectors and sinners, not to endorse their sin, not to coddle them in that behavior, but yes, to bring about a change. But we need to set the standard of, of the Scriptures teach us that we must reach out. We must help. And I want to look at some things that the Scriptures teach of what Jesus was as he was a friend of tax collectors and sinners, a friend to those who were recipients of his message, that we might try to do the same and emulate what Jesus did. Jesus was a friend to tax collectors and sinners and the fact that he was a real friend and that he was the one who sacrificed. A real friend sacrifices. Turn over to John chapter 15. John chapter 15, beginning in verse 12. It says, This is my commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends... For all things that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and, and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit, and that your fruit would remain, so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, He may give to you. This I command you, that you love one another. Now what I want to point out is it says a real friend sacrifices, a real friend lays down their life. What I find interesting is that when we realize ultimately, yes, Jesus sacrificed. Jesus sacrificed his life, right? Jesus sacrificed his, his comfort. But in many ways, what do we find Jesus also sacrificing? In some ways, Jesus sacrificed his reputation. Did he not? That was, the, that was the accusation coming up. Is you, the reputation that we have of you, and we're going to tell everybody about this. But everybody know. You know what the reputation of this so-called Son of God is? He is hanging out with sinners. 
And Jesus did not deny it. He, he did not try to correct. He basically said, well, we're going to find out later what you'll be able to see the kind of people that I'm hanging out with and the kinds of things that I'm doing with them and the kinds of things that you will later see them doing as a result of my closely associated with them. Wisdom will vindicate who's really got the right spin on that statement. We, we know the value of those who befriended Jesus, who He befriended, even in their sinful condition, He helped them to accept His message of repentance that they needed to change. And so yes, a real friend sacrifices. Will we be so concerned about how people think about us? Or will we be willing to sometimes sacrifice even our own reputation for the sake of someone who needs a friend? Someone who needs a, an ear to listen to them. Someone who needs to help out for the sake of trying to bring the gospel to them. And we may at, in times find ourselves in situations where the reputation may be somewhat compromised because other people may be, may be quick to jump to conclusions, may be quick to smear our name. And we may have to be willing at times if, to choose, am I going to be a friend to sinners or friend to the name that I want people to think of myself. Jesus realized that a great deal was at risk, but was willing to allow people to come to, come to erroneous conclusions and then say, let's, let's wait for time to pass and we'll find out what the truth really is. Jesus was not endorsing people in their sin. Jesus was, Jesus was not telling them it's okay to sin. He wanted them to truly repent. In Romans chapter 5, we see the mindset of, of Jesus when He was on the cross. We talked about that in our class, in our high school class this morning. We talked about the amazing attitude of Jesus when He died for us in Romans chapter 5 and verse 6. It says, For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. He died for the ungodly. So when it says that Jesus was a friend to tax collectors and sinners, that's what they meant. He's a friend to the ungodly. Yes, thank the Lord that Jesus was a friend to the ungodly so that they could actually hear His message and it would resonate in their hearts so that when he, he, they realized how truly He loved them on the basis of that proof, they would turn to follow Him in true repentance, accepting the righteous behavior that He wanted them to embrace. But at some point, he had to get that message across that they truly were in his mind, that they truly were loved of him. And verse 7 says, For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I want to make a comment, and I would make this suggestion Jesus died the exact way that He lived. Do you know that? Jesus died the exact way that He lived. How did He die? Between two thieves. That's how He spent His life, wasn't it? He didn't die any differently. <laughs> he was constantly in the midst of people who were sinners. But we realized, what was the benefit of people who were in His presence? One changed. He was not endorsing their thievery. He was not endorsing their lifestyle. He was in love trying to bring them to repentance, trying to bring them out of it. Jesus died the exact way that He lived, in the company and the presence of people who needed a Savior. And so we must also be a friend who sacrifices. Are you willing to sacrifice how potentially you may be looked in the eyes of others for the sake of those who need the Gospel? Jesus did. A real friend loves always. A real friend shows concern always. In Proverbs chapter 17. Proverbs 17. In verse 15 it says, He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous, both of them alike are an abomination to the Lord. Why is there a price in the hand of a fool to buy wisdom when he has no sense? A friend loves at all times. And a brother is born for adversity. 
There are times when we find ourselves in situations of life where, yes, we are making poor decisions, when we are led by the impulses and the desires of the flesh, and it is wrong. And we need to be told that it is wrong, and we need to be told how to get out of it, but we need friends around us who truly will show their love and support to encourage us to make the right decision. And that's what we see Jesus doing, loving at all times. In fact, that's what Jesus commanded us to do in the Sermon on the Mount. He challenged everyone, he challenged every individual in his audience when he said, God sends his reign on the just and the unjust, does he not? God continues to love at all times. And said, must we also demonstrate if we are to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect, to show love even towards the enemies? To show love even towards those who don't deserve it? A real friend loves always. And sinners who see that kind of love demonstrated will respond. That's what Jesus showed us. Do we love them always? Or when there are sinful decisions, when there are sinful uh, uh, things going on in their life? Well, not going to be as concerned about you, not going to show as much interest. It's one thing to be said about being corrected. One thing to be said about church discipline. When we need to exercise that to bring about repentance. But we're also taught to admonish them as a brother, not to treat them as an enemy. We are to always love. Yes, correction is love. And we're going to talk about that as we continue. That Yes, correction is, is continuing to love them. And we need to realize that our, our, our mission is to show love in, in every possible way. In correction and encouragement and rebuking and admonishing. But a real friend loves always. In Jeremiah 31, in verse 3. Jeremiah chapter 31. In verse 1. He says, At that time, declares the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. Thus says the Lord, The people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness. Israel, when it went to find its rest, the Lord appeared to him from after, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have drawn you with loving kindness. How often do we find the Lord expressing that to even those who were being disciplined by Him, His children who were being disciplined? He kind of says, I've, lo I've not stopped loving you. I've drawn you out with loving kindness is why I'm trying to reach you. In Matthew chapter 26, Matthew 26 and verse 47. Matthew 26, 47, we read this. While he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, came up accompanied by a large crowd with swords and clubs who came from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he who was betraying him gave them a sign, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him. Immediately Judas went to Jesus and said, Hail, Rabbi. We know he was not being completely sincere in that, was he? Yet look at what Jesus said. And I remind you, it says in 1 Peter chapter 2, there was never, ever any deceit in the mouth of Jesus. He said, friend. Friend. Do what you have come out to do. Judas was always the friend of Jesus. Judas was not always a friend to him. Judas was not always responding to the interest that Jesus would have for him. And yet Jesus, who there is no deceit, there is no duplicity in his mouth. He washed the disciples' feet, him included. He bestowed on him a sense of honor. He with him whom I dip this in the in the, the sauce is the one who betrays me. I might pass that along to. Truly, what's so fascinating is when we realize that we are guilty of our sin, when we realize our wrongdoing, we feel the weight of that. Sometimes the most overwhelming feeling is the thought that Jesus and our Lord still loves us. It's in that love He seeks to correct us and teach us to go to Him, 
to turn away from our sin. And it is because we can always trust. He is always our friend. He says, friends, I call you friends because I lay down my life for you. And we are always to be considered His friends. Even when we're being corrected, even when we're being disciplined. He loves us always. A real friend always loves us and loves us fiercely. In Proverbs chapter 18. Proverbs 18. That's what he says in verse 21. Proverbs 18, verse 21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. The poor man utters supplications, but the rich man answers roughly. A man of too many friends comes to ruin. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Closer than a brother. We need to be those friends, those loyal friends. And sometimes the most crucial time in our life when we need a friend is when we are making decisions that are detrimental to our salvation, detrimental to our well-being. Because that friend who sticks close to their brother can oftentimes get in and say things to us that we need to hear. Maybe we don't want to hear, but we need to hear them. But when we have friends who love us at all times, how what a blessing that is that when we love fiercely as Jesus was fiercely devoted to all who would come and hear His message, that they would be gifted with the, with the one who loved them to tell them the truth, to tell them when they needed to turn away, to tell them when they were in great danger. It was Jesus who loved His own disciples, who warned them. Remember when He came and saw them sleeping? He'd say, oh, I understand you're a little tired. He said, no, get up, get up and pray. Jesus was their friend. It's only a friend that loves us when we need to be loved in those times. We need friends who love us at all times when we need to hear things that help us that maybe we're not doing. Friends help us with that. Let's be fiercely devoted to one another that even when we need to encourage one another to do better, to change, to watch out, if we're not careful. We need to be that devoted to to listen to one another and teach one another. In Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. No, verse 28. Mark chapter 10 and verse 28. It says, Peter began to say to him, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms along with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. Jesus letting His disciples know those who followed Him, I recognize the sacrifices you have made and you will be rewarded. I'm fiercely devoted to you. When we realize that someone is with us to the very end and there is great reward in being faithful and true to them. Helps us when we realize that the his word is full of needed rebukes, needed encouragement, needed uh, chastening. When we're not doing the right thing, when we're not vigilant, when we're careless. It is this friend who tells us, I'm mindful of the sacrifices you've made to follow me. But he's so fiercely devoted to us that he tells us what we need to hear. That's a blessing. That's a valuable thing. We need to be fiercely devoted to one another to tell each other at times what we need to hear. But know that we are fiercely devoted to one another, that we will help each other accomplish and get to that point. Turn to Hebrews chapter 4, and this is what the Lord, who is fiercely devoted to us, who tells us what we need to hear, who chastens us, who rebukes us, He tells us, but we can always know we can do this. We can always do this, even when we're, when we're being told. Daniel, this, this is not wise. Daniel, you, you need to get out of this. You need to stop doing this. This is what he always tells me, though, in the same breath, in the same conversation. He tells me the same thing. He's what he wants me to know he's communicating to me. Hebrews 4, verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. He's a friend, and that while he's telling me he knows what I'm doing is wrong, he also does it in an understanding way. I can see where you became weak. Not excusing it. Not passing over it like it's not a big deal. But then doing what? One 
who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Some of us, the biggest thing we need from one another is help. Sometimes we're really good at being fiercely devoted to, okay, when, when, when my brethren are wrong, I'm going to let them know. I'm going to let them know. Well, what about the help needed to fix it? Are we fiercely devoted to one another in that sense? Jesus never left His sitting, sitting friends hanging. He didn't just tell them what was wrong. He was willing to correct and offer the solutions and offer the support and the help that would get them out of it. And this is what Hebrews says for. I love this passage. It's telling us is that when we come to the Lord and we're responding to our great friend who loved us, who died for us, who's fiercely devoted to us, when we in our confession and our honesty are admitting, you're right, what you're telling me, I shouldn't be doing this. He says, well, I'm also your friend and you can come to me boldly to the, to the throne of grace to find help time of need. He will help us. He will help us. And that's what sinners in the world need to see from us that not only are we willing to befriend them, but we're willing to help. Help them. Make that journey of repentance out of the sin they're in. They shouldn't have to do it alone. We can help. As the Lord teaches us, He is willing to help. A real friend accepts. A real friend accepts us, but also encourages us to do better. But is willing to accept us, warts and all. I love that. that, that, that that's kind of the, the expression that tends to go through my mind over and over again. The more that I... I'm amazed by how much the Lord loves us and how much the Lord wants us to be with Him as He accepts us, warts and all. He's willing to let this be a, a, a situation where we're growing. It's a, it's, it's a process. It's a work in progress. And He accepts us on the basis of that. He's willing to deal with our, our, our weaknesses and deal with our, our problems. Again, we looked at Zacchaeus, but look over in Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7 and verse 36. Luke chapter 7, verse 36 says, Now one of the Pharisees was requesting him to dine with him, and he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume, and standing behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, and kept wiping them with the hair of her head, and kissing his feet, and anointing them with the perfume. And when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. And as she was, Jesus is loving, helping, encouraging, admonishing her in her love, in her devotion, in her service. How helpful the Lord is for us. We need to grow. We need to mature. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 11 that He is willing to teach us. And Jesus tells us what His goal is for us, that He wants to teach us. We need to realize that when we come to the Lord, we have still many things that we need to grow. We need to have still many things that we need to learn, still many things that we need to stop doing and, and add into our, our behavior. And the fact that He's willing to teach us Tells me that he is that patient friend who accepts us when we are willing to come to him on his terms. He is that friend who accepts us, warts and all, willing to continue to teach us and help us grow out of these situations that are still going on in our life. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28 Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And yes, a real friend corrects. A real friend corrects. Jesus, yes, is understanding. Jesus is patient, but He always tells us the truth. He always tells us exactly how it is. And I believe that's what makes it so much easier for us to accept it, easier for us to respond to it. It's because how patient He is and how kind He is and 
coming to us and allowing us to come to Him, warts and all, imperfections and all, and yet still addressing those things and helping us reform from them. Proverbs 27. Proverbs 27. And verse 6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. As a friend to sinners, Jesus did not just simply tell them life was wonderful. did not just tell them that they were fine as they were. He understood. He was patient. He was kind. But He also spoke very plainly the truth. Turn over to John. And we have the sinful woman. The adulterous woman. Who in her adultery is receiving mercy receiving kindness, receiving patience from the Lord, very directly was told, go your way and sin no more. Turn to John chapter 13. John chapter 13, verse 12. It says, So when He had washed their feet and taken His garments and reclined at the table again, He said to them, Do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. I, this is one of my favorite examples of the Lord's teaching because He is teaching His disciples while He is doing a great act of kindness and love to them. Remember what was going on while, which prompted Jesus to change His garments, to get down and pour water into a basin and begin washing the disciples' feet? What was going on there? They were arguing. They were arguing and debating amongst themselves as to who was more important. This great debate erupted. They start sizing each other up saying who's more important, who's going to be the most important one in the kingdom. And Jesus kind of silences it all, but He gets down to the greatest one there and serves them. And in that act of service, what does He do? He tells them, you guys are not <laughs> Well, what a great way to receive instruction when someone is being kind and helping and loving you. That's what he's doing. He's demonstrating how much he's concerned about them. He's doing this great act of kindness, caring for their dirty feet, washing them as a servant, and in the process, uses that opportunity. He's got their attention. He, they know how much he loves them, and he's telling them, you need to change. You need to be more like this. He, verse 15, says, For I gave you an example that you should also do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. One of my favorite examples when I read that Jesus says, Come to me and learn from me. His disciples said so many things they needed to learn. So much wrong. It's really off base. But he taught them as he cared and loved them. A real friend corrects, and a real friend. Forgives. In Acts chapter 9, verse 3. A real friend, after bringing the correction, after bringing the rebuke, when there is a response, the admission of guilt, the realization that change needs to take place, that humbling state of mind. If I was wrong and I want to change, a real friend forgives without question. A real friend forgives. Acts chapter 9. That's the greatest example of ultimate forgiveness. Here's the Apostle Paul at the time, Saul, wanting to persecute Christians and receiving this gracious vision of, of the Lord. He's blinded by it. Asks him what he's doing. Why are you persecuting me? And with this presentation, is going to let him know he is going to send a preacher who's going to teach him and encourage him to accept the grace that Jesus is offering that he's persecuting other people for receiving so that he might then be used as a vessel, a preacher of righteousness to go out and preach the gospel. Amazing. Jesus who corrects him and says, Saul, you're persecuting me. Saul, you're doing wrong. You're sinning. 
you are going totally against God's will, even though your conscience is not offending you. And the minute he accepts this, changes, he is added into the fold. Amazing. And Paul never forgot this, never realized what a friend Jesus was to him. Constantly referred to himself as the greatest of all sinners, the chief of sinners, the least of the apostles. By John chapter 21 and verse 15, and we'll bring our lesson to a close here, but I want to look at this final example of how Jesus was with the apostle Peter. In John chapter 21, We read in verse 15, it says, So when they had finished breaking or finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my, tend my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Shepherd my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He's going to continue to entrust him with the keys of the kingdom that he mentioned in Matthew chapter 16. He's not taking the keys away and giving them to somebody else. To so know just what I said you would do. I'm still trusting you to do that. You just needed to change. You just, you just needed to, to get yourself back together. Remember what Jesus even said. He said, I have prayed for you. He knew that Satan had asked permission to sift him like wheat. And Jesus says, but I have prayed for you. A real friend loves, even in the midst of our, the crisis of sin that comes upon us, a real friend prays, encourages, rebukes, corrects. And when we need to be brought back, receives and forgives. We just want to bring some of these things out that we might be uh, equipped by the Lord to do the same thing. To go out as we preach the gospel, to, to befriend sinners, to truly be a friend to them. In the sense that we want them to get close and be accustomed and be comfortable hearing the lessons, hearing what Jesus wants to teach them. Yes, knowing that we're going to be correcting, we're going to be instructing, we're going to be offering uh, the, the, the gospel in a way that's designed to, to, to blast sin out of their lives. It's the power of the gospel is the, the power to, to, to bring sin out, to expose it, and totally reform them and offer that forgiveness that Jesus shed His blood for let us be a friend to sinners. Let's be a friend to those who are lost. Not to coddle them in, in their wickedness or, or their rebellion, but just as Jesus did, to show, let wisdom be justified in our deeds. Let us go out and seek to save the lost. And want to offer an invitation to anyone who's with us who's never obeyed the gospel to recognize how much you are loved. Realize in your condition, even where you sit, guilty of sin, outside of a safe condition, God in His justice has every reason to execute punishment. He doesn't want to. His patience is being extended Peter described that, that patient, the long suffering of the Lord. Regardless, the Lord does not want any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. So Jesus befriended sinners, and Jesus extends his hand of friendship to any sinner here. Recognize to know that even in your condition, Jesus has bled and died for you. The ultimate act of friendship, he died for you. So that you might be pricked in your heart to realize, how can I continue living this way? Living for myself, living for my selfish desires? Give that up, repent and turn and serve the Lord. Once you confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, repenting of your sins, obeying this command to be baptized in water for forgiveness and to rise up to walk in newness of life, we want to encourage anyone who's never done that. Once you come, accept this gift from this friend, Jesus Christ, come and obey the gospel while we stand and sing this song.